Welcome to Brain Talk, everyone. Now let's talk brains. Dr. Rachel Ross is here with us today to talk about stress and snacking. When we're hungry, we all know what it's like to be and feel hungry. We get focused on food. And in general, if we can, if we have access to it, we will eat more. Hunger drives food seeking, the looking for food, the foraging for food, and it also drives the intake of food. But amazingly enough, we don't understand these behaviors. We actually have no idea what happens in between the looking for food and the action of fulfilling that need for food. And this is something that's a fundamental question of biology to understand how this um, need to feed gets integrated in the brain and leads to behavior outcome. So hunger state itself is actually signaled by the body, not by the brain per se, but it can also be influenced by sensory inputs from the outside. So that's gonna come in through the brain. And what we focus our studies on is the base of the brain, this region called the hypothalamus, which seems to receive inputs both from the brain itself, sensing outside inputs, and also from the body, sensing these hormonal inputs that tell the brain, hey, we are hungry, or hey, we have enough food, we can stop eating now. So within the hypothalamus, there are a couple of different types of neurons, and those neurons send projections to the front of the brain, the cortical part of the brain, the part of the brain that's really involved in executive function, decision-making, um, engaging with the outside world and thinking about how to act. And we're really interested in how those different signals, whether from the body, from the brain, get processed in that cortical region and allow an animal or a person to decide that it's going to act. What we have done with our animal models is manipulate the cells in that prefrontal cortex, in that region of the brain that's involved in cognition and executive function. And we found when we do that, we actually create in the animals an increase in food intake. So just by manipulating the front of the brain, the area involved in decision-making, we can have an animal eat more than it might metabolically need from its body signals. And we want to connect that to how we all decide to eat, whether we have um, an illness that might be associated with being overweight like obesity, or we have an illness that's associated with psychiatry and psychiatric um, illness, such as anorexia nervosa. Both of these are very different sides of body weight spectrum and illness presentation, but seem to involve this particular region of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. Overall, my lab is very interested in connecting again across the body signals through the hypothalamus to the prefrontal cortex and this cognitive decision-making part of the brain. And the hypothalamus, importantly, is an area that also processes all sorts of stress inputs. Um, the hypothalamus then, while it's getting inputs from the body, also sends inputs or sends um, messages back to the body and tells the body how to respond. Um, so it's a, a bit of a complicated picture, but Overall, it's something that we're looking at at different levels in the body, in the hypothalamus, in the cortex, in different models, both in mice and in humans, to try to understand this underlying question of how do we decide what's good for us when it comes to food. Thank you so much um, for that brief introduction to your science. Um, I think we could, we could start with, you know, what got you interested? I'm pretty excited about hearing about the ice cream truck first before we get to the pretty of the science. <laughs> uh, the ice cream truck was like my, my literal first high, was my first job in high school. Uh, once I got my license, I guess before that I did work as a librarian um, because books, but um, a friend of mine decided this was a business that he wanted to start and he was in college at the time and so he needed drivers and I was a trustworthy responsible young teenager um, uh, there's a, a bunch of words that you wouldn't put together <laughs> <laughs> we talk about teenagers but okay I also had experience <laughs> driving a van so okay. it was something that it was I, I had this expertise, let's call it. And so he was like, I need drivers. I will pay you minimum wage. Please don't eat all the ice cream. And you can please take this on 
you know, this one day a week. And so it turns out being in high school and having an ice cream truck is actually cool because you can bring it to school and all of your friends will want to buy the ice cream. So I made a killing for my friend's business, not for myself, <laughs> going to like high school events, you know, whatever sporting events were happening, I could bring refreshments and also to construction sites over the summer because I, <laughs> they're hungry. Uh, <laughs> they're working. Cool. I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about you know, one of the goals of Brain Week, of course, is to inspire the next generation. Um, and we like hearing about people's stories, you know, why they got into science, how they got into science. Did you have mentors that were uh, particularly formative for you as a woman in science? Uh, you know, and the nurse, when you say neuroscientist, you and I and Timmy are not the picture that pops up in people's heads typically, right? And so part of it is to sort of change those perceptions. And yeah. can I tell us a bit, a little bit about yourself and your journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, so driving an ice cream truck was not part of getting into science. For sure. <laughs> it was part of making sure I had money in my pocket to do other things. But um, for me, it was mostly driven by the fact that I wanted to understand how everything worked. I just really wanted to understand how the world around me worked. Why is the sky blue? All of the annoying questions that you ask your parents. My parents had no idea and did not know how to tolerate any of it, any of what I was asking. Um, and I'm from a pretty close knit community up in upstate New York. And my parents had one friend who was in science, was actually a chemist and worked at Kodak. And he was wonderful to me. Um, he did not have kids of his own. So he was kind of like, yeah, sure. I'll bring Rachel to work. Yeah, sure. I'll engage Rachel's science fair projects. So my elementary school, high school and high school science projects were all mentored by a chemist at Kodak. Um, through him, I was able to do one summer project where I got to work in the lab and worked on liquid crystal displays, which was not a thing. I, I was really excited by physics because physics kind of explains the world. Um, and it was something that I was just, at the time, I could tell you everything there is to know about liquid crystal displays, but right now I don't remember. But it was just a really cool thing that was early days of flat screen TVs. Actually, I don't even think flat screen TVs were a thing at the time, but now we're way beyond them. But it was something where I was able to to get my hands on to um, mm -hmm. actual science, see what's happening and, and do that. And I think from that also, there were a couple of other things. He mentored me, my dad helped with this too, in a couple of science projects for you know high school science. No, this was middle school science fair. Um, at what temperature, what's the perfect temperature and the perfect amount of time or the right amount of time to get a, a perfectly uh, medium boiled egg. And so just, iterative, um, and food was always there, um, iterative boiling and, you know, watching the clock and actually looking at our results and the, we still have a poster in my family. Yes. I get made fun of on a regular basis for that one, but, uh, you know, so, so what I'm hearing is mentors, <laughs> right? Mentors are very important in science. Yes. And this is something that, that we know in the science fields. Um, so for anybody, you know, in the audience watching who is younger and is interested in science, find a mentor. And this person does not necessarily have to be somebody who is your family um, or a friend, um, but email a scientist, right? Don't be afraid. Uh, Timmy, myself, Rachel are all people who welcome um, that kind of uh, interaction with the community. I often get emails from high school students in the area who say, hey, I saw you on a website and can I, can you, can I chat with you over Zoom about my career plans? I'm like, absolutely. Um, so don't be afraid um, to do that. Yeah. Um, so Rachel, uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll remind the, the audience that if you have questions of your own, please put them on the Q&A because we'll make sure to answer them towards the end. Um, but first, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, stress and snacking, right? This, you know, you, you explain very well how that sort of brain gut axis works, right? The idea that our brain talks to our stomach um, and that, you know, it is important to eat healthy things so that our brain is healthy and, and vice versa. Uh, but one question that I get from students and family members a lot is motivation to eat, right? So some people have a really strong drive to eat mm -hmm. and other people are like, yeah, I mean, I like food, but I don't need it, yeah. right? I, yeah. I love food, but but with chocolate, I can, <laughs> my friend thinks I'm, a, I'm an alien. I open up a pack of M&Ms and I can eat half of the pack. Right. Because after half the pack, I'm like, yeah, no, I've had enough. 
Whereas, whereas like, my friends, yeah, my family like, is not like that. <laughs> okay, oh. Most normal yeah. people in the world are like, you know, I'll down three bags of M&M. Neurodivergence okay. of M&M eating. Right, right. Oh, you so, open the pack and that's it. <laughs> so what's different about my brain and other people's brain? Who Always be snacking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and actually it's an interesting question and I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to keep it tight to allow for more questions, but those are things that we are very interested in working on. And we have some findings related to motivation within the model that we're looking at. But one of the things that I think is most important that we don't generally spend a lot of time thinking about is what happens in development, what happens in early life, because the patterning of these neural circuits that are important for motivation, whether it's for natural reward, like food, or for substances that get added on later, like drugs of abuse. These are the, the connections between these cells and between these circuits are laid quite early. And so there's evidence that shows that early life stress, maternal stress when um, babies or pups are in utero influences later metabolic outcomes and possibly through some of those awareness of hunger, interoception, which is the sort of like um, awareness of your body feeling of hunger, um, mm -hmm. as well as the motivation and the motivation fulfillment that is a, that the body becomes aware of. There's a particular um, disease or, or syndrome called Prader-Willi syndrome, which is a rare genetic syndrome that um, has a phenotype of insatiable hunger, extreme motivation, as it were, for eating and an inability to stop eating. But when the people with Prader-Willi disorder are babies, they have no capacity to eat. They have something called failure to thrive. They actually have difficulty with um, getting food in from the mouth to the abdomen, which makes a big difference in the way the brain perceives the hunger experience and the way the brain perceives being full. And so I think future studies, hopefully, will include the opportunity to look at some of these elements within development, to look at some of the environmental impacts. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think one of the things that's come up and has been um, more interesting in the setting of COVID is this awareness of food insecurity and the effect of food insecurity and general stress-based insecurity of any type um, on patterning adolescent behavior, child behavior. And the outcomes include, again, things related to eating disorders, obesity, metabolism, development of anorexia and binge eating, as well as standard psychiatric illness, increased mood disorders, increased suicidality. And so these things, I think they're all connected. It'll be wonderful one day when we can disentangle them. Right. So, so I guess just to, to, to summarize for, for audience. So what you're saying is that early life um, environment, right? So whether you had a traumatic childhood or you endured things um, that other people didn't can actually change how your brain is wired for food, yeah. right? So, so whether or not you are more motivated to eat, whether or not you are more prone to use food as a um, sort of self-soothing mechanism, yeah, right? Okay. That That's point, exactly it. Does it matter what type of stress because we can, you know, when we talk about maternal stress, there yeah. is a bunch of different types of maternal stress. And yeah. then can you also speak to resilience because the people that have, un, you know, that have had a very traumatic early life adversity, either from maternal stress or just from the yeah, individual right. themselves yeah. and don't and develop the resilience to not go out. Yeah. You know. yeah, I think, I mean, so that's a thing that I think is a, it's a great question. Now, in mice, when we study stress, we use the simplest paradigms in order to say like, hmm, this is, this is a stressor. So we do things like a simple foot shock, which is an electric shock to the bottom of the animal's foot, which is not an enjoyable experience. But that- And I should say, because we're talking about animal welfare though, that it's not actually shock. It's more like, like when you touch the doorknob in winter and it like gives you a little shock, like it's yeah. not like a yeah. uh, it's shock. not the worst. It's not the <laughs> worst. worst. Yeah. We're not hurt. It yeah. is yeah. approved in the spirit <laughs> of animal welfare. Sorry. Yeah. And, and so, for, so, okay. For example, that is a potential stressor. Now in the setting of real human world, is that really a stressor? It seems to have an impact on circuitry, brain activity, and behavior outcomes. But does that really model what's happening in humans? So I, I, would, I would say we do the best we can with what we have access to and we don't want to hurt the animals. And actually, frankly, I don't ever want to 
um, assign the trauma to my animals that we tend to in reality around us. Right. So all that aside, I imagine to me that there are specificity to the types of trauma, but the things that are probably most relevant are the critical time periods of development. So the critical window of when these traumas happen and different traumas are going to have different impacts at different windows based on where an animal or a person is in development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an important point because, you know, separating the maternal stress so the stress coming from how the, you know, the mom during pregnancy versus how she takes care of the kid and also like the kid themselves going through the stress during like early, um, you know, adolescent years or something yeah. and seeing how that, how that important. I think that'll be a very important to, yeah. important aspect to disentangle. I'm, I'm working on trying to model specifically that, uh, kind of trying to figure out what the right timeline is to start to get, to get an output, to get an outcome so that we can then, you know, further study what actually changes over time. It's not a, it's not a quick process. You know, yeah. this is the type of research that takes quite a bit of time and quite a bit of funding. So, I wonder what about, um, you know, so so these are things that we can't really control, right? Um, what about what about how we raise our children outside of trauma, right? And I'm, and I'm thinking back to the, you did really well. Why don't we take you to her ice cream? Or you're sad, you want an ice cream, right? We tend to solve problems or, you know, try to increase mood by giving children food and foods that are good. And yeah. I wonder is part of that, are we creating associations that later in life will be sort of overused? Yeah. Um, so I, I totally buy into that from a psychology, psychiatry perspective, but I think that's a cultural thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's a US cultural thing that we actively associate um, caretaking and reward giving with access to sweet, high fat, high sugar, not so good for you foods. So we do, we enforce that association. Right. And from a cognitive perspective, it is possible to unlink that right. association. Right. There are people, and I guess anorexia is a really good example of this, mm -hmm. um, people who are capable of finding food to be aversive and particularly those high fat, mm -hmm. high sugar, high calorie foods become threatening and become the opposite of what we tend to normalize as let's go to friendlies, let's go get ice cream. Uh, friendlies is my upstate New York life. But uh, <laughs> so I, I think I don't have any evidence for that to be um, true. I don't, that's not something that we actively are studying in the lab right now, but I, I definitely ascribe to that idea as a model, um, as something that is meaningful. And it is something that we use, again, in psychiatry, in my clinical practice, when we're working with people who have significant uh, difficulty with eating habits, and we work towards building or creating new habits of associating food, thoughts, actions. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. I think we have some questions. Mm -mm -mm. So I, I was just I just wanted to piggyback on that and just talk a little bit more about anorexia because I think that's an important point. Um, sure. And maybe for the for the sort of benefit of the audience, um, you know, you started to talk about sort of changing associations. Like what for parents out there of children who are suffering from anorexia, you know, what are some things that that people can do um, to try and combat this illness? Ooh. First is awareness. So first is literally talking about it, um, talking about it with anyone, talking about it with your friends, talking about it with your parents, talking about it with your doctor, um, recognizing that it is something that is not necessarily helping you. And I think the main thing from my perspective for any teenager or young person to know is that um, you actually need food in order to develop body and brain in order for these things to function at their fullest capacity. Um, and it's an interesting conundrum because there is an element of the experience of food restriction for people with anorexia, how it can be calming. It can, ha it can lead a person to feel that they are more capable, that their brain functions more clearly with less food, but that is not the case for long-term. And in general, I'm thinking long-term when I'm thinking about people with anorexia. Um, so talking about it and recognizing that um, having rules and having a fear of food and fear of body gain, body weight gain 
um, is something that unfortunately is not in your own individual best interest. Um, and with that realization, thinking of, is it possible to undo that association, to recreate new associations where food can become comfortable and the things that are going along with that, the potential underlying anxiety or the associated anxiety, the underlying depression or associated depression, the other comorbid illnesses of which there are so many that co uh, come together with mm -hmm. anorexia, those can be treated in other ways than by restricting food. And I'm talking specifically about restrictive anorexia in this case, because that is the most common that you see in um, young women in this country currently, but it's also increasing in males in adolescents as well. There are a couple of questions from the audience that I want to get to before we're almost done. How did this happen? <laughs> How did 20 minutes just like fly by? Uh, so one question relates to um, uh, chronic exposure to short term stressors. So we talked about sort of, you know, life stressors like, you know, poverty or trauma. But what about short term stressors that happen over the course of your life? Um, yeah. Do they have an impact on uh, your propensity to eat high caloric foods. So I, I think that depends on your, um, your general response to the high caloric foods. If high caloric foods are something that give you some pleasure or give you some experience of calm, mm -hmm. then any stressor is Me going too. to be, yeah, any potential <laughs> stressor is going to potentially lead to, um, increased intake mm -hmm. of those foods. And what we see is stressors, even acute ones, actually lead to um, palatability changes. So your mm -hmm. desire for different foods, whether they are crunchy or sweet, everybody has a different starter set of what is enjoyable and provides that joy. So everybody's mm -hmm. Um, engagement in that action is going to be different. I do want to mention chronic exposure to short-term stressors kind of translates to a complex trauma. And that's the type of right. thing that is quite hard to model. So I just, from a, a terminology perspective, anything, even if it's short-term in the moment, if it keeps happening, that ends up kind of having a, a chronic stress sort of a, a look. And that tends to change some of the body um, hormone caliber that changes the way that the body processes food and then engages in you know, the next step of eating. But we're, we're still working on disentangling that. So we got another question. So the question is, are there clear behavioral or neural differences in the relationship between, I think you've kind of touched on that a little bit, yeah, yeah, between yeah. acute, chronic, and appetite. And I think- Yeah, and, and I, yeah, so I think we talked about it a little bit with anorexia and a little bit just now, but I think um, acute is, um, again, depends on you and your wiring. Um, and the chronic, if you are wired to reduce your intake when you are stressed in the acute setting, the chronic becomes comparatively potentially not sustainable. If you are wired to increase your intake in the acute setting, the chronic can potentially lead to body weight gain, as you might imagine, but that's sustainable with life. That's actually fine. Um, so the, the last question, and I think I want to, I want to leave on maybe a positive note, right, of how to how to change our behaviors. Um, the last question says, how can we rewire our brain to experience the same dopamine rush that we experience from sugary and fatty, fatty foods um, to nutritional foods? <laughs> can we convince our brain that nutritional foods are also comfort food? <laughs> So I will, I'll look to, um, yeah, I, I honestly think that it depends on your brain. Um, everybody's brain is quite different. If you think about, I'm going to think of this as, you know, you, you can, people will believe whatever they want to believe. And this can lead to psychosis, a lack of awareness of reality, but this can also lead to really enjoying nutritious foods. So you can train yourself in a habit-based way um, to experience great pleasure and joy from a bite of a carrot, which by the way is quite sugary, but doesn't have fat. I love carrots. Um, I, like again, that. <laughs> I, I personally, I love, do you all know what sorrel is? 
this is I just happened to find it at my farmer's market this week in Queens. It's um, a very lemony green that can be cooked or used in salad. It turns out I love sorrel because I love lemony greens. You don't have to put anything on it. It just tastes bright and amazing. I would eat the ground if it was all sorrel. Um, I don't know where that comes from. I'm quite certain that wasn't my childhood with the ice cream truck. But um, I think if you want, if you want something, if you have that motivation, you can train yourself to do that. And it's just about consistently doing it, um, training yourself and recognizing your response to it. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing this with something that you actively hate. I do mention that this is easier done as a young person than an older person, yep. <laughs> but it's possible no matter the age. Hey, the brain is an amazing organ, organ and we can convince ourselves of anything that we want if we really put our mind to it. Yes, I I'm not sure how reassuring that. that is to audiences, <laughs> but, but it is possible. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> so that's something to the fact that as a kid, your parents are like, eat the greens and... <laughs> right, right. Which amazingly, I know we have to leave, but amazingly, I feel like broccoli is making a comeback. I don't know if other parents feel that way, but but my kids love broccoli and, and their friends love broccoli. Like, I think our generation did something right. I don't know what it is. It was broccoli. Put cheese on the broccoli. I don't know. Oh, good. Anyway. anyway. All right. Thank you so much for Thank being so with much. us, Rachel. We really Lots enjoyed the conversation. Life. Thank you for having me.